Please be seated, and I invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew 18, or be ready to follow the scriptures on the screen at home or here in the worship center out in the courtyard. So at 15 years old, I became a follower of Jesus, and when I was about 16 and a half, I was asked for the first time to share from a pulpit, to share a testimony for 10 minutes, and I started being taught and trained how to preach and teach at about 16, 17 years old. So for over 40 years, I've had the privilege and the joy of opening this book, which is the Word of God from beginning to end, and teaching what's in it. And I've always said there's two topics that people push back on the strongest, but I've had to add a third one. When I say people push back the strongest, all I can say is from my own experience as a pastor, there's three topics now that when I preach about them, I'm pretty confident I'm going to have people talk to me afterwards or send me a note or send me a text or write a letter and say, I didn't really like that or I didn't like this about you. There's, there's three topics that just tend to bother people. You ready to hear what they are? I'll tell you the two that have been there for a long time and the third one that's been added to my new list. Finances. Money. When I preach and teach about money, people get like, you stay out of my business. And they don't want to hear about it. That's not everyone, but some people. And, some, and people kind of push back. That's what I'm not going to preach about that tonight. The new one is anything about sexuality. I know there's going to be pushback. There's so many different perspectives. If I, if I preach biblical sexuality, I'm going to get pushback. Not going to preach about that tonight. Here's the third one. Forgiveness. And this seems to be almost the deepest one for many people. Because when I preach out of the Bible about forgiveness and I bring a message that, that really seems to tell people that God's design and plan for their life, for their spiritual health, for their own freedom of their own soul and for the good of other people is to actually forgive. I have people come up to me and say, Pastor, I understand what you're saying. I get your message. But if you knew what he did to me, if you knew what happened to me, you would know why I don't have to forgive. If you, I have... So many conversations. I know forgiveness is good. I know God wants us to forgive, but I'm the exception. I don't have to. Because my situation was such that it doesn't, that this person cannot be forgiven. And then when you, when you preach and teach and talk about forgiveness, and I want to make sure that, are we, are we all okay? Okay, good. Are you? We're so, we're so glad you are. I just want to make sure that we're not having, we don't need any help. Okay, perfect. Thank you for coming. Good, good having you with, in worship with us. Blessings. Um, when it comes to the topic of forgiveness, we live in a world right now where somebody can look at another person and say, I've never met them, I don't know them, but did you hear that they, put, they tweeted something seven years ago? And they're unforgivable. They're horrible. They're, and, and people will be angry and, and, and not for, cancel and not forgive somebody who they don't even know and don't even know what they did or if they really did it, but we're just so quick to not forgive. Into that, Jesus tells a story. And what I call the story is this. I call it a shocking, challenging, troubling, and needed story. Matthew 18, 21 to 35 is a shocking, it'll blow your mind, it's challenging, it's going to challenge you, it's troubling, you're going to be bothered by something you're going to hear tonight, and it's needed in our lives. If Jesus taught it, we need it, amen? amen? Even if it's shocking, challenging, and troubling. Listen to the word of God. Let it sink into your soul. I, I want to even dare to say, let it bother you. If you're getting bothered as I'm reading it, remember, this is Jesus teaching. I'm reading the words of Jesus. So we begin in verse 21 of Matthew 18 to, set, to get the setting of what's going on here. Then Peter came to Jesus. Peter, one of the disciples, so close to Jesus, been walking with Jesus. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Not just a rumor, not just a memory. They actually sinned against me. And Peter says, up to seven times? This was a very generous offer Peter's giving. I'll explain why in a, in a couple minutes. Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Or that can be translated seven times 70. 490 times. Whether it's 77 or 490 is not the point. Jesus says to Peter, the amount that you're thinking is generous forgiveness, blow it apart, because it's beyond that. Verse 23, now Jesus tells a story. Let this story speak to your heart. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king 
who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold, okay, was brought to him. I'll talk to you about how much that is in modern economy in a couple moments. But just 10, you don't have to know your mathematics to know 10,000 bags of gold, a lot of money, right, was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, obviously he couldn't pay it, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay a sliver of the debt, a little bit. That happened in the ancient world, all right? Verse 26, at this the servant fell on his knees. Now pay attention to this. See, in your mind, picture this. At this the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. In a hundred lives he couldn't pay back everything. But he said, be patient. I'll, I'll do all I can to pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. What's going to happen next? Verse 28. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him about a hundred silver coins, a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of what he had just been forgiven. And this guy who just had been forgiven all of this gold bags, all this, he grabbed him and began to choke him. He physically assaulted him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him. See if this sounds familiar. Be patient with me and I will pay it back. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Did you hear that just a few seconds ago? Right? That's what this guy was just saying to the person he owed. Be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. They were just shocked. They, they knew how much this guy had been forgiven. And now he won't forgive somebody else a fraction of what he just, I mean, he had just been forgiven and he can't forgive this guy. Then the master called the servant in. Here's where it gets troubling. Brace yourself. Then the master called the servant in. Who's telling the story? Say it out. Who's telling the story? Gentle, kind, always, always very gentle Jesus, right? Listen to the story. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Read that again. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Hmm. Good thing that has nothing to do with us. Verse 35. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. I don't want that. You don't want that. Troubling? Challenging? Yeah. But we understand that Jesus died on the cross and rose again. We're going to come to the table tonight and have communion. We understand that we're forgiven. Yes. But I, I believe that Jesus is using the strongest possible language to shake us and wake us and understand the deep importance of forgiveness. That when we don't forgive, it devastates others. It devastates relationships. It devastates our world. It devastates our own soul. And so I, I, I think, and, and the Bible at times uses hyperbole, sort of overstatement for effect, you know, something to, dramatic to just to get people's attention. I, I don't believe this is saying if you die and there's something you haven't forgiven, you're judged. You know, I, I don't think it, but what Jesus, I think Jesus is saying is you need to understand there's a connection between how God has forgiven us and we, how we forgive others. Whether you want to believe it or not, there has to be a connection. And there's a connection with how we forgive others and how our God looks at us and sees, do we really under, do I understand that I've been forgiven? Do you really, if you're a Christian, do you understand how much you've been forgiven? And my prayer is that tonight, God will open our eyes and our hearts and our minds to the depth of his forgiveness so much that it breaks our hearts when we can't forgive someone else, that it drives us to our knees and causes us to learn to be forgiving. In a world that is becoming more and more and more judgmental and unforgiving, 
One way that Christians will stand out is if we can learn to do what Jesus is teaching in this parable. So Jesus, this is our prayer. As we're, we're halfway through our sermon time, we just pause and say, would you speak to our hearts? Would you challenge every one of us? And Jesus, I pray this asking, praying for myself first. Lord, that when we're wrong, that when we're offended, when somebody is out of line, when somebody sins against us, that we would understand what it means to walk on a journey of forgiveness, that we would understand that it doesn't mean we let people abuse us, it doesn't mean that we let them do it again, but it does mean something changes in our hearts and that we understand the depth of your grace so much that we can't not forgive because we understand the greatness of your grace. I pray that tonight in your word and in our worship and in the bread and in the cup, we will feel the depth of your grace at a new level, in a new way. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I wanna just think about this passage together, the simple story that Jesus tells. First thing I want us to recognize is that we all have a sense that there is a point where our forgiveness no longer makes sense. You see this in verse 21. Peter comes and says, how often should I forgive someone who wrongs me, a brother or sister who wrongs me? Up to seven times. Where did Peter come up with seven times? Well, in those days... The rabbis had lots of sayings, and the rabbis were often quoted. And here's one of the sayings of the rabbis in the first century, all right? So the Jewish rabbi, the rabbinical tradition, had a huge influence on a lot of people, and, and, and most of the disciples came out of a Jewish background, so they knew the teachings of the rabbis. And one of the ra rabbinical statements said this, if a person commits a transgression, if a person commits a sin, the first, the second, and third time, they will be forgiven, but not the fourth time. That was a rabbinical saying in the first century. What were the rabbis saying? You can forgive once, forgive twice, forgive three times. After that, guess what? You don't have to, what? You don't have to forget. That's what the rabbis were saying. So when Peter comes and says seven times, he, he's taking the rabbinical teaching, he's doubling it, and he's throwing on a bonus one. Seven times. It would have seemed crazy. It would have seemed generous, magnanimous. You know, Peter's going seven times. And Jesus says, Peter, Seven times 70, or seven times, you, 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 should, you forgive way beyond what you can imagine or even think about doing. And, and so, so there, there's things, and, and then also the Mishnah, which, which was, was again, part of, part of the Jewish teaching and the, and the Jewish body of teaching, said this, said, if a person says, I will sin and repent, and I will sin again and repent again, he will be given no chance to repent. So the mission is saying, okay, if somebody sins and repents, okay, second time, okay, third time, no more chances. So in the current day, three times or two times were the numbers for forgiveness. Peter says, what about seven times? And Jesus says, what about 77? Or what about 490? What's Jesus doing? He's taking the expectations and he's blowing them apart. But what's he wrapping it in? He's wrapping it in the grace of God. He's saying, Peter, do you understand the greatness of God's forgiveness for you? Do you understand? And you will one day, because Jesus hasn't gone to the cross yet. But he's going to see the forgiveness of God. He's going to see the grace of God. He's going to end up, end up preaching that grace and seeing thousands of people come to faith in Jesus after Jesus dies and rises again and ascends to heaven. So here's a question. And tonight we're going we're gonna to be reflecting. When we come to communion, in the middle of communion, before we, when we have the elements, when we talk about what it means, before we partake, we're going to have the worship music, play some music, and we're just going to quiet our hearts and say, God, speak to me. So here, I'm going to give you some questions to begin thinking about as we just ask the Lord to speak to our hearts tonight. Here's a question for you. When do you stop forgiving? Where do you draw the line? Some of you go, it's not three, three times, not two times. Burn me once, you will never burn me again. I will never forgive you. I will never let it go. And again, Jesus isn't talking about letting someone abuse you and abuse you and abuse you. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about the condition of our hearts and our understanding of grace and how we treat other people. You might even be in a time where you're, you're, you're so judgmental of others that there's people you hardly even know, but you see them, you look at them, and you know they're just, you know that you know everything about them, you know that you can just judge them. And is that the heart of Jesus? And in a moment when you hold the bread in your hand, when you hold the cup in your hand, and when you remember the broken body of Jesus, remember the price he paid to forgive you, the greatness of his grace that washes all your sins away. Jesus is trying to get our hearts in that place. 
And then Jesus made it clear that his forgiveness has no boundaries. And we are to live like him. Jesus, Jesus is wanting us to understand that. So, so he tells this story. And here's this, here's this guy who, who owes so much. And he can never pay it back. And yet he's forgiven all of it. And what does he do? He turns around and starts to strangle a guy who owes him a fraction of what he was just forgiven. We, we can look at it and go, oh, what a horrible guy. What a bad guy this was. Well, time out. You know who Jesus wants us to be thinking about at that moment in the story? That wicked, bad servant. Is that who Jesus is trying to get our attention on? Who is Jesus trying to get us to think about? Ourselves. No, 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 no. I'm the hero in every story. I'm the good guy. I'm the good woman. I'm the, I'm the, the, the righteous person. Boy, be careful when in every biblical story you put yourself in as the hero. Right? David and Goliath. I'm David. Well, maybe you're not. Maybe I'm not. You know, and and I, I think Jesus is trying to say, listen, recognize yourself in this parable. He's trying to wake us up and shake us up. So here's a question for you. Are you ready to forgive others like God forgives you in Jesus? Are you ready to forgive others in the same manner that God forgave you? Now, when God forgives you, he doesn't say keep on sinning and doing things that are wrong. He wants you to be transformed. So when you forgive others, you're not saying just keep doing wrong things. And, but, but you are saying, I'm not going to hold this against you. I'm not going to continue to live in bitterness and hatred and anger. Jesus wants us to understand that I have been forgiven more than I can imagine or ever pay back. The first servant, these ten, in, in the older verses, it say 10,000 talents. Here's 10,000 bags of gold. Different scholars have tried to figure out the mathematics of this. If you figured a person an average income making $15 an hour, which is kind of, kind of getting around the California minimum wage these days, if you're working with $15 an hour, this would equate to about $7.5 billion. Okay, this, this, this servant owes $7.5 billion, and they're working for somebody else as a servant. They're not making minimum wage. How long does it take to earn enough money to pay back $7.5 billion? You can't do it. So Jesus uses this number that's just insane to make a point. How much have we been forgiven? More than we can understand. The second servant, if you do the same equation at $15 an hour in our economy today, owed about $12,000. So the first guy's just been forgiven $7.5 billion. Your slate is washed clean. His slate is washed clean. And now we see somebody who owes him $12,000. Get over here. Pay me what you owe me. The guy does the exact same thing he does. Forgive me, show mercy, I'll pay it back. When he did that, the other guy washes that away. When this guy does the, <coughs> does the exact same thing, he throws him in jail. Anybody you've thrown into jail recently? Now don't be too easy on yourself. I'm gonna say linger with me here. We're gonna come to the table. We're gonna talk about grace. We're gonna, be, we're gonna leave here knowing we're forgiven. But can we linger for a minute and let ourselves feel uncomfortable? We sometimes put people in the penalty box. We put them in jail. We put them in the naughty chair. We block them out of our life. I will not reach out to them and be kind to them until they do to me because they're in the wrong. I will not forgive them until they prove to me that they're worthy. Here's the secret about forgiveness. We don't forgive people because they're worthy because they're not. And if you're waiting until somebody's worthy and deserves it, you'll never forgive them. We forgive because God in Christ forgave us. I heard an amen. I was, I, I was wondering as a pastor, will someone say amen? We forgive because God in Christ forgave us. Amen. amen. That's why we forgive. Not because they deserve it. There's times my wife forgives me. She does. Because I'm a very imperfect person. And it's not because I somehow have become perfect. It's because she understands that she extends to me what Jesus has given to her. And I thank her for that. There's times I forgive her. We don't, it's not transactional with another person. It's heavenly. And we understand the forgiveness of God. We can then forgive other people. So a question. Am I willing to look deeply at my heart, life, attitudes, motives, and actions and recognize the depth, the depth of God's amazing grace? Will I look at my life and say, God, you have been so good to me. It, it, my 10,000 talents, my 10,000 bags of gold, you know, what you've, what the, the sins that God has forgiven are bigger than I comprehend. How do I then go to somebody else who's done something that's a fraction of what I've done against God and refuse to forgive them? Will I forgive as God in Christ forgave me? When we cry out for mercy from a truly repentant heart, 
God is always ready to forgive. When we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. When we cry out for mercy, God is waiting to forgive us. And if you're a Christian, you've come to the cross, you've received his grace. And one day you'll stand before God and God will look at you and he'll say, what sin? He won't see your sin because God forgave you through Christ and Christ paid the price. But you receive that gift. And when you understand the greatness of that gift, you then want to extend it to other people. When we cry out for mercy from a truly repentant heart, God's always ready to forgive. So here's a question for you. What do you need to lay at the feet of Jesus today? In just a couple minutes, you're gonna hold in your hand a, a wafer, a piece of bread. You're gonna hold in your hand a little cup with, with juice in it. And you're gonna remember the body of Jesus. You're gonna remember the blood of Jesus. And I hope in that moment that, that you will just say, say to Jesus, I come and lay at your feet. Some of, your, some of you, your prayer is gonna be, God, I know I'm supposed to forgive. This person has hurt me and wronged me. I've been holding it inside for a week, a month, a year, a decade, 40 years. You may, you may be holding bitterness towards somebody who's died already. You still won't let it go and forgive them. My prayer is that this is the night. This is the night that you say, God, I will let it go. In the greatness of your grace, I will lay this down at the foot of the cross. As I partake of the bread, as I partake of the cup, I will remember the price you paid so that I could do this. God expects us to forgive others like Jesus forgave us. That's God's expectation. This story, Jesus' teaching, the stark wake-up call that this is, is a call for us to forgive others the way God in Jesus forgave us. So before we, before we come to the table, I want to ask you this question. Who do you need to forgive at a deeper level than you ever have done before. I want to ask you to bow your head right now and to quiet your heart. As you do, I'm going to invite the worship team to come and join me. I'm going to ask Pastor Dennis to come and join me. And I want to ask you just to, to quiet your heart and say, who do I need to forgive? And you know, if the Holy Spirit puts someone in your heart, can I just give you an invitation? Don't push it away. Don't start making your excuses. Well, but not, not, God, give me someone easier to forgive. If God, give, if God brings to your heart and your mind the, the greatest offense you've experienced, would you just begin to pray right now and say, Lord, may I learn to forgive like you forgave. Quiet your heart and prepare yourself to come to the table. We don't come to the table because we deserve the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. We come because he has invited us to receive grace. And these elements are reminders of grace. If you're not holding the little cup in your hand, I want to invite you just to hold that in your hand right now. If you're at home, I want to ask you, some, most of you are used to nights of worship and you already have some crackers and some juice or some bread and some wine, whatever you have. But if you don't, would you get those elements and join us as we partake together? And as you hold those elements in your hand, and if, you, if you're able to, you might want to even just open the, do, take the bread piece out first. Don't eat it yet, but just take the bread and hold it in your hand, the little cracker there, the wafer. And then the other side, turn it over and slowly peel off the uh, Take off the, do the juice side second, do the bread first so you can turn it over and have that juice upward. But as you're getting, holding the elements in your hands, listen to these words from Luke chapter 23. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified Jesus there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, and this is a prayer he prayed for the people who were crucifying him. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. They divided up his clothes by casting lots. In Psalm 32, 5, listen to these words. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover up my iniquities. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Our God loves to forgive when we cry to him. Colossians 3.12 says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, with patience. 
bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. We read in Luke chapter 22, after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Wherever you are tonight, um, whether you're at home or in the courtyard or in the worship center, um, as you hold the bread or the wafer in your hand, as you hold the cup in your hand, this is a moment where Jesus invites us to remember Jesus said, you know, do this in remembrance of me. This is the time we remember Jesus. We remember his sacrifice on the cross. We remember his perfect sinless life. We remember the first time we understood that our sins were washed away and that we were made white as snow. We remember Jesus in this time of communion. So right now, just in your heart and your mind, remember Jesus, all he's done for you, all he's washed away, the new life he's given to you. When we come to communion, we come as a family. You are part of God's family. If you're, if you're at home right now or on the road traveling, we may, we may be people who have been you know, on, on a drive somewhere, you pull to the side of the road, you're, you're, you're worshiping with us in your car somewhere, just on your phone, wherever you are, you're part of this family because you're part of the family of God. If you're in the courtyard, you're part of this family. In the worship center, you're part of this family. So we don't come to Jesus and remember his grace alone. We come in community because you know what? We all needed the grace of Jesus. Amen? Amen. He died and gave his life for all who would believe. And if we put our faith in him, our sins are washed away. Now we have to live like it. We have to live like our sins have been washed away. Like we understand we've been forgiven of more than we could ever pay back. So that when somebody offends us, we act like Jesus. In this time of communion, we remember grace. In the cup, we remember the blood of Jesus shed. Grace, undeserved payment for our sins. In the bread, we remember the grace of Jesus. Undeserved payment. By his stripes, we were healed. And so we prepare ourselves to come to this table. If you hold the wafer in your hand and just prepare yourself to partake. quiet our hearts now and in this quiet moment we're going to take a couple minutes and just listen to the music but more than that talk to Jesus who do I need to forgive why is it so hard maybe just ask Jesus this question how much have you forgiven me just let your mind run through your life all the things he's washed away all the things he's made right just quiet your heart Before we partake of the elements, let's focus on Jesus and the greatness of his grace. This bread 
reminds us of the body of Jesus, his love, his sacrifice, and the gift that he gave. Why bread? Why bread? Because bread was life. It came from the crops that they planted. It was profoundly nutritious. It was the center of every life. And in taking the bread, he said, now I am profoundly the center of your life. So we break the bread as he broke his body for us. Let's partake of the bread together. we bless is our communion with the shed blood of Jesus Christ. As you hold the cup in your hand, remember the biblical teaching that Jesus was called the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The ancient people of God understood that there was a cost for sin. They had a ritual of sacrifices that were hard for us in our modern world to comprehend. One of the things that Jesus did when he came is he said, that's all done. That's all done. Only one more sacrifice. One sacrifice that would cover all sins of all people who would receive it. The final lamb, Jesus the Messiah. He gave up his life, he shed his blood to cleanse you make you new. Your 10,000 bags of sin thrown in the deepest ocean. So partake of the cup and remember the greatness of God's grace and the gift he's given to us. Let's partake together. Lord, tonight, in this moment, we remember you. We remember. Because we've paused to consider all that you accomplished with your death and resurrection for us. Us whom you adore and delight in. Thank you, Father. Help us continue to remember. And remember to forgive as you forgive us. So we thank you for all that you've done, all that you do, and all that's to come through you by this incredible time, this incredible moment, this incredible ritual of remembering through the breaking of the bread and taking of the cup. Father, we honor you, Jesus. And we do so from our hearts, and we do it all in your precious name. Amen.